statement saying we don't have a quorum yet. This is not an official meeting yet. Right. I just said that, so that's fine, I guess. Okay, this is not a quorum. <laughs> but now we're live, right, Guilford? So. You are being recorded. Thank you. Okay. Well, so do we want to get started with um, our presenter? Tell us, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to message Tate right now. I'll message both Joe and Tate. But... Yeah. And you said Stefan already told you that he's not he's, coming. He's a no, yeah. So. Okay, so do we want to just read that statement about, oh, we're having a non meeting, but I guess we can still read yeah, it. Yeah, it's not a meeting, so it doesn't matter. I think. Yeah, we don't need to read a statement. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, that okay. um, acknowledges it's actually. A but can we, um, can we let Eve in from the waiting room, please, Guilford? No. Guilford. You've got to stay yes, there. Please. <laughs> <laughs> there she goes. Eve. So should we get started with Stella? Stella? Yep. Are you ready? Welcome, sure. Stella. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um I this is hopefully just a very kind of informal beginning of a conversation. Uh, but I did prepare some slides. Well, actually, Great. a lot of them aren't my slides <laughs> um, that I'll share. Uh, let's see. So um, my name is Stella D, and I'm currently on ECAC. Um, and we've been talking for a while about how it would be great to collaborate more closely um, with TAC. We've probably been talking about that on ECAC for almost a year. And it just it just has taken till now, which is which is uh, great. Um, but so I was just hoping to give a little bit of background that maybe you all know, but this is also perhaps for the benefit of people who watch these meetings on YouTube or what have you on what ECAC has been doing for the last couple of years, what we're doing now, and then what we see as some, some particularly uh, compelling places to collaborate with TAC. So, um, this was, I should also say, I don't know that I'm the best person on ECAC to present on the CARP, which is a Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan, because I wasn't really, I wasn't on ECAC for, for its writing and development. So if you have any questions on this, I may or may not be able to answer them, but it is a very long document and there's many people who are happy to answer those questions. So the Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan was this really amazing document which I think you all probably got the link to. And that started in the summer and fall of 2020. Um, well, it started before then, but that's when there were task groups that were assigned and there was a lot of like community input. There were a lot of focus groups chaired by ECAC members. And then there was a review and it was adopted by the town manager. And the CARP calls for, sets out climate, pretty ambitious climate goals for Amherst um, with, CO2 emissions being 25% below 2016 levels by 2025, 50% below by 2030, and um, carbon neutrality compared to 2016 levels by 2050. Some plan principles include equity, accessibility, and belonging. Racial and climate justice was a really important, is a really important part of the plan. Local wealth creation and fair distribution and community involvement and connections. And then the sectors of the plan, it laid out pretty specific goals for governance and communications, buildings, renewable energy, land use and natural systems, transportation and infrastructure. And I should stress that because this was adopted by the town, this is theoretically now supposed to guide all of the work of the town. Um, governance and communications, I'll kind of skim through the ones that aren't transportation because that's really, I think, where the focus of TAC is and the focus of, of um, my communication with TAC is, but there's there's governance and communication, these broad principles of enhancing equity, increasing participation and leading by example. And then under these broad principles, there's more specific goals uh, that are up to 2025 and then split into 
up to 2025 and then 2025 and beyond. So that includes multilingual municipal communications. And an example of, of one for beyond 2025 is supporting universal broadband internet access. Then there's buildings, which ECAC recently has been spending a lot of time on buildings. Those broad principles are energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, affordability, and quality of life. And PACE is something that we've really been focusing on, which is the property assessed clean energy. And then beyond 2025, hopefully including um, establishing building energy performance standards. Some of this also gets into a recent initiative to for an enhanced stretch code um, that we're pushing for. So land use and natural systems includes growing food locally, good stewardship practices, and balancing competing land uses. The more specific goals include increasing access to green space, recreation and community gardens, and fostering a coordinated regional food system. Okay, and then here we get to transportation infrastructure. Sorry, did you have a question? Sorry, um, Guilford, can you just let Tate in too? Sorry to interrupt, but oh, now, yeah, we have, no now we have a quorum. Now you need Great. to start the meeting. <laughs> Okay, we will officially start the meeting, which is always a good thing. I, um, can I just interrupt you then? Can and read um, Stella? I'm just yeah, gonna for sure. So sorry to about start that. the meeting. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, twenty twenty order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting of the TAC is being conducted via remote participation. It's now um, this meeting has officially started and we are getting a presentation currently from Stella D who is talking, uh, talking to us as a member of ECAC on um, the work that they've done um, so far. So go ahead, St Stella. Yeah, Thank you. sure. Sorry. No, of course. So transportation infrastructure, the car, uh encouraged encouraging well stated that like the broad goals are encouraging mode shifting decarbonizing vehicles achieving zero waste and preparing for climate impacts this is mostly preparing for climate in, impacts to infrastructure and mm -hmm. transportation infrastructure in this context so in the roadmap to 2025 that included prioritizing transportation safety and accessibility transitioning rapidly to zero emission vehicles and developing an evidence-based zero waste policy. Beyond 2025, that included developing a robust alternative transportation network, supporting regional transportation demand management, facilitating zero emissions, electric vehicle car sharing at apartment complexes, mainstreaming zero waste infrastructure and programs, integrating climate adaptation and water resources management, and then preparing the infrastructure for climate and community resilience. Um, so that was basically the, the the work of the CARP. It was it's a very large document again with a lot in it, but that's that's the CARP in a nutshell. Does anybody have any questions on 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 that? No, great. No, thank you. And I know, I mean, some of us had participated. Like I had participated. I know Eve had participated in the transportation working group. Amazing. So, yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. I, I hadn't even made that connection, Tracy. I was just going to say, I've never seen this document, which is really pathetic, and it looks amazing. And um, anyway, yeah. Eve was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess you did see some some small part of it, but that's great. That's that's why I'm here. Everybody is very busy. And um, so, it's, yeah. So uh, our current ECAC vision in charge is to work cooperatively with the town and community to raise climate awareness and achieve results with a sense of urgency. In everything we do, we will put environmental justice at the forefront of our decisions. And this is the slide that we've been initiating all of our meetings with. Recently, it was created by our chair, Vasu Raghavan. And I want to point out here that one of our sub charges um, is to liaise with multiple member bodies, businesses and residents, regional organizations and institutions on programs in policy, which I would say includes you all. <laughs> um, so this is what we had suggested for the town manager goals 2023, which is something we were working on. And with respect to 
transportation, I would say the things that jump out are the taking necessary steps towards and supporting the town council and developing a waste hauler bylaw that is feasible and meets the goals of offering universal curbside compost pickup and pay as you throw fee structure. And if adopted, start implementation. That's ongoing. Stephanie Sicarello, who's our um, town liaison and the town sustainability director, is currently working on completing a fleet vehicle inventory for all of the town, the town vehicles. It sounds like that's a pretty involved process that I think will take some time, but that that's also transportation related. Um, I, I'm thinking about whether or not to, to highlight anything else. I would say the creating a climate goals community dashboard would perhaps be relevant to some of the stuff that that we could work on together because i i've i i love the bike and pedestrian safety plan that you all are working on and it seems like some of that might be relevant if we were to create a community dashboard also for the greenhouse gas inventory mm -hmm. So for the 2025 roadmap, what we've done on ECAC is we've split this up. So one person is kind of point person on these different mm, goal categories. We only have one person on each because it gets tricky with open meeting law to, to collaborate. So any collaboration we try to do in the meeting, but there is collaboration on all of these. There's just not offline communication kind of in accordance with open meeting law. So we've split them up into heat pumps and as a subset of residential energy, thinking about regional and state collaboration, solar, everything to do with solar, because obviously the solar survey is going on right now. And that's a little bit of a category of its own. Mm -hmm. Uh, transportation, which I'm the point person on right now, and and C pace. So for heat pumps and transportation, we've been having an educational series. There have been two in transportation so far, and I think a really nice next one perhaps would be for one of you all to come present if you wanted to. Um, so far, we've had a presentation by Aaron Convery, who's the transportation planning manager for the city of Durham. And she talked about just what they're doing there to support like a just transition with respect to transportation. Um, and then yesterday we had somebody from the Drive Green team from Green Energy Consumers come talk about electric vehicles. So for anybody watching the recording or anything, these are both available, or the one from yesterday might take a little bit, but they'll both be available on YouTube. And we've split off the education series as separate from our, just our meetings. So you can also just watch the education series if you want to. And then the main thing I'm just here to talk about is, is possible future collaboration with TAC. So would anybody want to come present? On, on your plan and current TAC activities. Vasu pointed out that it would be really great to collaborate on goal setting, on the goal setting process for the town manager in fall of 2023. And then I can imagine it would be nice to co-sponsor in-person events. Like I, I had watched a couple of your meetings from back in the summer and I watched one that was about the walk, bike, roll to school day, I think. Um, and maybe next year trying to get something together for that. And then other, just wondering what, what thoughts you all had and, and what's going on over in tech. I have a question Hopefully. related yeah. to that. I mean, I do think it's interesting how um, ECAC put together goals for the town manager. Now, is ECAC a committee under the town manager or? Yeah, so we're a great question. We're under the town manager. So we, we tech our charge <laughs> to advise the town manager. Yeah, we have a town council liaison, but really we're supposed to be advising the town manager. But also, but, but the town manager does the appointments. So in some ways you're under the town manager. 
you yeah. know, like, even if you, so just in terms of advising somebody that you're, on, anyway, I wasn't sure exactly how that works, but. Yeah, so my understanding, I, I'm, I am probably not the best person to ask about this because my understanding of like municipal chain of command is, is imperfect, but my understanding is we come up with these goals and then say like this is this is what we think you should consider I, I i can get more clarification on the process whether we sent those to like the town council and if they but i think we just sent them to the, the town manager saying hey we think you should mm -hmm. consider focusing on this well i mean i think it's an interesting idea and i i guess i also like the idea of like if we if tac was working with ecac and you know other committees like I know I regularly attend the disability access advisory committee meetings because of their overlap with transportation and transportation safety and access and that you know if there are if there are goal if there are goals for the town manager or you know goals for the town that are supported by multiple advisory committees that you know maybe that has more impact than just like an individual committee saying these are our goals and another committee saying these are I mean if a number of advisory committees have come together with the overlapping goals so that's just totally yeah no that seems totally true I mean yeah. because because one of the things I've heard from the when the council is discussing the town manager's goals you know in terms of like benchmarks and things for what the town manager needs to achieve I mean there's so many different projects and activities going on in this town that I mean basically you know that the town I and mean, there's only so many hours in the day and so many town staff and so on and so you know the projects that are kind of up at the top of the list are the ones that the town manager and the staff are going to focus on so anyway so go ahead I mean Eve if you want to talk and welcome, Joe. Stella, this is our other. Hey, member. sorry, I'm late. It's Hi. A, no worries. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm not officially on the attack anymore, Stella, but um, because I still care about this stuff, I come a lot um, and, and they let me um, join the group. Um, but I just wanted to say, it, wow, amazing work, super exciting ideas. Love your list at the end. Um, wish we'd talked. 15 years ago. Um, so uh, really, really great. Yeah, yeah, great. And I really would encourage anyone who hasn't to look at the CARP. It's a really impressive document. I mean, you know, uh, as you probably know, Stella, I mean, part of why I am on here and others are on here is because we wholeheartedly believe in alternative modes of transportation. And um, so, you know, part of what we do, I mean, I don't know how much you know about what we do, but we advise the um, public works director and like, you know, the actual street things that actually happen on our streets, you know, and projects that happen on our streets to increase um, the ability or, or facilitate walking and biking, right? As well as car, you know, there are car issues too, right? But a lot of us are on here because we really believe in alternative modes of transportation as well as public transportation, which we're really lucky to have some of that, you know, a good deal of that in our town. Um, so I, I, I can see how we, you know, our kind of activism will fit into your particularly your your aspect of the ECAC, right? Um, I would love to figure out how, you know, we can use our purview and your goals to, to really increase the number of people that bike, walk, roll, or take public transportation every day in this town, right? Um, because I think that's, you know, the only way to go in the future. Um, so thanks, but well, but I think that's how we can we can really 
help because we're in on a lot of these project town projects, right? That we are we're always saying, let's have bike lanes, increase the ability to walk and make um bus, you know, essentially bus transportation in the town really work for more people. Well, and one thing related with safe routes to school is that um I mean, so one of our, our member who's not here tonight, she had been leading some of the safe routes to school activities and she and I, you know, met with different principals over the summer and and we are continuing to try to build some momentum from that from the schools because it is really going to take some volunteer efforts in the schools. Um, but the Safe Reach to School program last year, or maybe it was, yeah, last year, it expanded to be like K through 12. So it's not, it used to be K through eight and they added the high school grades. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of tying in with the environment and when I think about, you know, the clubs at the high school and things to tie into environmental issues, that that could be a good way to go with it too. That is not just about like the younger grades may be a lot more focused on like the safety of their kids and so on. But then you also just talk about the carbon footprint of everybody driving and kids driving to school and just really thinking about it from like a sustainability point of view. And I would love to tie in with the students. Yeah, I wonder because another thing that we've been talking about a lot at ECAC is how to better collaborate with I think I forget the the acronym, but it's the Amer Amherst Client Climate Justice Coalition. Well, and there's like Sunrise, like, and I mean, there's some other groups right. that doing that work too. Yeah, right. I think now Sunrise is part of that. Like Sunrise, Mothers Out Front, like a bunch of the, those organizations all got together, and so I wonder if 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 trying to really um, focus on on safe routes to school school as a point of collaboration because that would be something that could maybe we could be talking about that over the summer and then try to do something like in the fall um might be nice eve so a couple things one i wanted to say you know I, like I said, I just opened up um, your document 15 minutes before this meeting, and I had never seen it before. Um, part of what's really impressive about it is like, not only do you have these really great goals, but you talk about how you're going to achieve them and you kind of have a timeline. Um, and in the attack, we had tried to do that several times. Um, so, you know, and, and I had been on the attack and its predecessors, Tracy had been on it, Kim has been on it with me for many years. I think we're the old the old timers here, um, and you know there's been this series of documents: the transportation plan, and the complete streets plan, and then the um, the pedestrian and bike plan. The latter never got finalized. Um, it's still waiting the final map, and it never got adopted by the town. And we also like just at the before COVID came up with like um, a list of priorities for the budget. That, that I think, you know, never got adopted or communicated. So, so in some ways, it really seems like ECAC has taken things further into taking goals into a vision of what you want to do and how you get there, whereas TAC has often kind of um, worked, you know, either plan by plan on a specific plan or either like project by project or event by event. Um, and so what I'm seeing in your plan is, is, you know, town support for a, a, a really ambitious vision and an ability to say the steps to get there. Um, and so, yeah, it seems really exciting and possible to think about how do we take what you've done and your vision and bring in so many of the things that the TAC has talked about over the years and its predecessors and maybe build them together. So I think actually each of your bullets um, were things that I could imagine us talking about. The budget priorities, the events, the, um, I forget what else it was, but um, yeah. And then I'll just say in terms of school, I've also tried to get a group off the ground at UMass. And I, I think um, there's tremendous potential um, to do some work at UMass. I've long had a vision of UMass as a place where people come from across the state. And if they weren't all bringing their individual cars, 
um, and could actually learn how to bike and use transit while they're here, they might then take that back to their towns. So anyway, so that's it's just a little pitch for another hat I wear, but um, it seems like, yeah, each of these things, well, okay, this is great. So the educational series, it seems like there are a couple different things, probably tech people could talk about the goal setting process. I think we could go back to that document we had three years ago, as well as some of the stuff that the tax done since. Um, and then, yeah, we've talked a lot uh, multiple times about doing, you know, instead of just, you know, how walk to school day works so far is like everybody drives their car down yeah. to <laughs> downtown and then they walk up the street, right? Yeah. But instead, you know, to to block off, you know, half of each of the main arteries in town and actually have like a, um, you know, what's it, what do they call it? Like a bike parade or a bike train or a, yeah. So that would, I, I just think that given the vision and success you've had at sort of getting the attention of town and, and having these things to some extent codified and supported by the town, it, it could be a really amazing um, collaboration. So, so I wonder, particularly with the, um, you know, the potential new elementary school that's happening, um, where there are significant problems that we've all talked about with um, having children walk to that school. Like that's one, as far as I can tell, it's one of the major problems with the site. There are other great things about the site, but part of the site is like, I can, none of us have been able to see how it makes sense for anyone except potentially a butters walking to that school um, or biking to that school because of all the trip. So, so I feel like that's like a real thing we could, we could really collaborate on, you know, with your, with your ear to the town manager and our like knowledge of transportation and hopefully with some help that we might be able to get from our town, our, our Guilford. Um, those are the kinds of things I think could make serious impact, you know? That's a great idea. I think a collective push to make sure if this, if the vote goes through to make sure that the new school, like whether it's, <coughs> but it's I'm not, not, I'm not right a now, person, it's I'm not, not a transit all. person. Yeah. It's yeah, not, yeah, yeah. not a ball right now. Totally. Like yeah. Or, right. No, so I we, just, we had done uh Chris and uh, Chris who's not here and I had done um like bike peg count like, at all the elementary schools in last spring and um and basically nobody walks to almost any of them. I mean then the most people walk to Crocker and that's because there's a neighborhood adjacent to Crocker that you just take a little path from the parking lot over to this neighborhood and there's also an apartment complex like right at the base of the driveway of Crocker. But a lot of the other streets, I mean, historically, there were people walking more. I mean, there isn't any more. The town is spending some money improving the sidewalks and, you know, in that general area, like in the East Village area. Um, but I was reading today, for example, about the Safe Reach to School program, and they do have infrastructure funding that can, you know, be up to like $1.5 million or more. And I know East Hampton, like Springfield recently got that money and East Hampton has a new project too. It was talked about in today's Gazette um, where they're doing some rail trail like connection improvements. And then it's also going to tie into the Safe Reach to School project. And so, yeah, it would be great to build momentum there for sure. And I mean, I'm also interested in Valley Bikes. So um, we did have, um, people come from North Amherst, you know, when they were looking at the capital improvement budget about creating another Valley Bikes station in North Amherst. I know Valley Bikes right now it isn't up and running yet. Like they're working on the new contract with the towns and the city of Northampton, but um, you like to promote that as well. And just some alternative modes seems really good, so. Yeah, I can see a lot of synergy, but I, I like the idea of like working particularly on, on these specific projects that could have some high impact, you know, because those things like seem like things we could actually do together. But do we, do we want to start off with just getting the bike ped plan actually finished? Yes. I mean, yeah, that yes. should be our number one I agree. thing, right? I mean, we, 
we need ECAC and all of its um, uh, just just to bring the inertia with it to bring us over the end line with that uh, uh -huh. project. Yes. So, I mean, that, we... yeah, it's nice for us to think about all these other projects, but let's just get past the biggest one first, right? The biggest hurdle. Let's get a plan in place and then we can start going forward. Yeah, no, we need to. an amazing plan. I bike all around town with, since my daughter was like 10 months or so, and now she's three and it's like sometimes a little scary. And I read the plan and I was just like, yes, <laughs> these are the routes we need. So <laughs> it would be great. It would be great. We're definitely like, I think speaking on behalf of ECAC, we we feel this plan is very important and and would love to see it completed. Eve, Eve go ahead. I love those as like two starting priorities. Um, I, I think your idea about the school is a fantastic one just because it's so timely and the potential is there to start off right the bat off the bat, both building the infrastructure, but also like building the practice, you know, so right off the bat, the first walk and bike to school to the new school could be you know, different than the other ones where we really like are training people how to bike. I mean, I lived in Oregon for 17 years and Portland and Eugene teach kids how to bike and walk safely. And they, you know, do it collectively at first until that's how you, that's how we recover walking and biking as, as transportation modes. And then if kids do it, they're going to think yeah, they can do it when they're older. Um, and then I agree with Marcus too, that um, if, if ECAC can help get us over the finish line of the bike and ped plan all that needs to be finished is the map and then approval from the town um that would be you know those sound like two fantastic collaborative opportunities that that could be great no definitely yeah well those are some goals so great yeah well, no this you. that that would be great um there's something else about schools. Oh, on the topic of youth and and um alternative modes. So one of the one of our initial ideas for the transportation educational series that was a really good idea that one of one of our members, Jesse Selman, had that I tried to follow through on. And it just he he thought it would be really cool to have a panel of students from either the middle school or the high school talking about their experience taking the bus system mm. um, in the context of kind of youth mobility. And it was a little challenging to find um, students who both take the bus and would be willing to come to a Zoom meeting in the evening, understandably, and talk about it. Uh, so this is just a call that it, if any of you know of anybody who's a middle school student, high school student who takes the bus, and has thoughts about it, we would love to hear from them, either in person or via writing, whatever's easiest for them. Um, no, that's, that's a thing. great idea. But so again, I think that's where we could tie in, like with the student groups. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, my, well, I mean, what, you know, my kids take the bus sometimes, but they mainly take it when they, yeah, that's not their first choice. And they would, they would not want to speak publicly about how right. their parents make them take the bus. So, yeah. Would would these kids um, contact you directly? I could ask my both of my kids who are at the high school right now and see if they yeah have. they can totally contact me directly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It seems like there are quite a few kids who bike, um, also. So that might also be something. Yeah, totally. Any any youth using transit, if if uh, people, you know, 15 to 18, 13 sure. to 18, whatever is, seems appropriate to talk to a Zoom, you know what I mean? Well, uh, even some like college, like, I mean, I have neighbors who didn't get their driver's license until their 20s, you know, and they did manage to get around on transit until then, so... Mm -hmm. I know that's a little older, but they, it can also be an example of like how you can do it and you can have a job and you can yeah, you know, be a successful grown up. Especially if they happen to go to community college, which are really hard to get to oh, um, yeah, for without sure. a car. Yeah, so that's pretty much um, 
that's pretty much what I was hoping to talk about. I actually do need to go make dinner at some point. <laughs> uh, it's my dinner. No, night, thank you so, for coming. Thank you for coming. Uh, tonight. That's great. Great. Yeah. Feel free to reach out at any point and let me know if anybody would be willing to come speak at any point about right. what you all are up to and kind of do what I did. Yeah. But, no, it would be good. I would love to speak about the bike ped plan, but I'd like us to have more of a success story to share <laughs> a little bit about getting it done. But oh no, I don't. I don't think we do. Right. Oh. I think we need this relationship to help bring it over the end. Sure. So, we so can't... Marcus, are you volunteering then? I I will talk to my wife. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Good. All right. Well, thank you, great. I think you're underselling the plan. I think it's a great plan. I didn't realize it wasn't complete when I looked at it. So well, and we also want just like you have the plan, the car plan. We'd like it to be endorsed by the council and like made official. Yeah. Right. So I mean that's a key component too. And we're happy to write a memo of support or whatever. Um, Thank you. That. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I mean, right. we need to vote on it, but I feel confident that everyone would. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Thank much. you so much. All have right. a great evening. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Well, that was pretty awesome. And um, I think we can find many paths forward with, with the ECAC. Um, uh, do yeah, I, think, I didn't get I a chance. I mean, Eve had looked at the plan. I mean, it, I remember when it was being created, it seemed pretty amazing. And so I will send around, Stella did send a copy of her slides and I'll send the link to the plan again. So if people wanna look at that before the next meeting, that'd be great. I do think um, one important order of business is approving the um, three sets of minutes that we got from January. Okay. If everyone could take a look at those, I've looked at them already. I'm going to go get my charger and perhaps we can vote on them when I return from my charger. If everyone <laughs> wants to take a look, they were sent out this afternoon by Amber. Okay. Okay. So did everybody see them? They were in an email. I'm just pulling it up now. Here's whatever happened with the company that pledged 20,000 for the bike station. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so they needed some additional money. Um, I mean, it was in the North Amherst. Um, and so, I mean, they had pledged to pay that and also to pay like the maintenance fee and things like that. Um, but I think it was dependent on some town support as well. And I'm not sure where that capital request stands or if there were other funds available to do that piece of it. Um, but I thought it was a pretty compelling, it didn't ever come to TAC for a vote, but I thought it was a pretty compelling case about continuing the network. And it seemed like it did have some good support. Um, are we prepared to um, make any comments and or otherwise vote on the minutes? Yeah. No, you are not, Marcus. You are. Okay. I have no comment. I am um, more than prepared to vote. Yes, I am too. So I, I do have a question, though. It's like, do we ever want to, I mean, our minutes are so sparse right now. And that I do appreciate that Amber takes them, but um, do we ever need to have anything more? I don't know. Well, it seems like the January 19th one is super uh, large, right. but we have had some pretty brief um, meetings as of late. Yeah, true. I think we're fine. We're fine. Okay. I mean, yeah. I, as somebody who used to have to do the minutes for the old version of the committee and was always behind. I am very appreciative of anybody who will take minutes. Right. Yeah. That's and report right. them I'm, back. I'm not, and so I'm not trying to. Yeah. I'm not complaining. So, yeah. Exactly. I'm not going to complain. But um, so um, I think we should probably just um, uh, ban these. These are minutes from January 5th, January 19th. And February 17th meeting. Um, and uh, 
I feel like we should vote on them all um, at once, even though some of us were, uh, you know, absent from some of those well, meetings. Right. I guess we would just like not vote. I mean, so the the as you said, the January fifth ones are so brief because there was mainly the presentation discussion right. from the Pioneer and the nineteenth is extensive, but all of us it looks like all of us were here for that one. And Joe was absent for the February 16th. Um, so perhaps let's let's go ahead and do this officially. So the um, January 5th, two people were absent, Mar Marcus and Tate. All those in favor of accepting these minutes, please raise your hand. You, I think some of us who are not here. Yeah, okay, we great. Three members, um, okay. Joe, Tracy, and I all, right. um, and abstaining. The two of you, Marcus and Tate, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then um, there. So there are no nays, and for so those minutes passed. The next is the January nineteenth meeting. Meeting. Um, meeting. All of us were present. All those in favor, um, please raise your hand. All members present, except Tate. Are you okay? All members present. That was unanimous um, acceptance. Um, and so there are no that those meetings passed. And then um, for the February 16th, um, all those in favor, Joe was not here. All those may in favor, the four remaining members. I, yeah, I need just... hand, please. I didn't. Sorry, I'm just pulling them up right now. Thank you for- I hope you um, can see my hand. I, I can, I yes, no, I can, I can, I can. Thank you, Tate. Thank you. Um, all those, uh, the four members, except for Joe, who is abstaining, is that correct, Joe? Yes, thank you. Um, so those those um, passed. So we've now okay. done the, that administrative duty. Thank you one, two, three, four, um, And so it looks like the next, um, uh, the uh, agenda item is an update on the proposed street lights policy. Yeah, so um, I have not received, so la at our last TAC meeting, we had four members present and um, we did we did spend some time going over, you know, what we wanted to say as a committee. Um, we had previously met with the sponsors, um, of the proposed policy, Councillor Anna Devlin Gothier had come to two of our meetings, and Mary Jo Henneke had come to one of the meetings. Um, and we did take that motion, um, you know, based on the people who were here. So one thing we had heard from them um, is that they were going to. The last time they both came is that they were going to rework their proposal based on the feedback that they had received from TAC and other committees. Uh, so with that in mind, we took that, we had that motion. I'll just pull it up right now. But the, um, but I was a little surprised then because right after the TAC meeting was a TSO meeting. Is that right? And at the TSO meeting, the sponsors presented an updated version of their streetlights proposal because I thought that they would be speaking with us first. Um, they did not actually provide a copy of it. They were just referencing you know the changes they were doing and um i don't believe even tso has received a copy of it yet but it is back on the agenda and they are focusing on the lighting elements and not so much the different zones of where there should be and more and less lighting um which is good right. i thought but we still did want to take i just wanted to get the people who weren't here at that meeting just up to speed on what we had talked about so let me just pull that up <laughs> which is why I sent it around today earlier. Um, Guilford has a question, it looks like. Guilford, do you have a question? No, just hold on. Comment? Comment. Yes, please. So um, everybody knows where the playground is at Kendrick Park, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so at the playground, there's three lights, short lights that we installed to light the walkway that cuts across the the park. Um, we've actually changed one of those lights. Um, so if you actually get a chance and you're out walking at Kendrick Park with your kids or whatever at night during 
I guess pre spoke time. <laughs> you don't want to be there during spoke time, but pre spoke time. Um, uh, check out the lights and see which one you like oh. and which ones you don't like. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. how many new lights did you put in? Was it three or two? There's only there's only two styles of lights. Two styles. Okay. One's the traditional one we have all over downtown, the, the acorn, and then mm. one's a similar light to the acorn, but it's 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 different. Okay. My so, daughter's yeah. just learning to climb up the Kendrick slide, so I'll be sure to keep an eye out. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. it's, uh, it, it's it's um well it's just they're different. See what you'll think. So now is the lighting on on the Kendrick Park paths like all night? Are there timers on the lights or no, it's all night. Okay. We have zero smart lights. Well, I was walking home from work last night um, from UMass past Kendrick Park, and uh, there were quite a there were quite a large number of older people, older youth. Yeah, the spoke crowd and, we call it. Then, so, um, but I didn't. I don't remember them being particularly like illuminated or anything. But. No, that there's the the walkway has three lights. The park, gets, the playground itself has no lights. Okay, got it. Yeah, but I thank you for um, asking about that because I meant to bring it up. When... Oh, we were talking about the TSO. Yeah, right. So I was just pulling up um, the document, but go ahead, Eve. It's like giving me an error. Yeah, so, um, Tracy, I know you've just done a ton of research and pulled a whole bunch of resources on um the importance of street lighting for safety yes um, and i i believe also for um like invitation because as we know for people to bike and walk they need not only to be safe but to feel safe right so for some people lighting may be important even if someone might prove in some statistical analysis that if they get their eyes adjusted that are going to be fine that it still might make the difference to whether they bike or not you know what i mean mm -hmm. or walk at night. It, perceptions um, matter a lot yes yeah so um i know the tso and mandy joe and company didn't invite you to do that presentation for them but do you think you could do that presentation for the tac um sure we could look at that i don't know if other, i mean you, you other people are members of the tac but um, so obviously you all should be the ones to decide this, not me. But to me, that would be really useful is to sort of have a full sense of what, you know, the evidence and, and, and research says. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I can look at doing something like that. I mean, the I mean, I've also seen really good workshops like about it as well. And, you know, I can also share some of those links. I mean, the or I could. Yeah. Or I could put some of them those slides in my own presentation. I or think something. that's a great idea. I mean, because there's a lot of resources. I mean, I've I myself have watched like a number of webinars about safety at night. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing that came up at the TSO meeting, um, I will pull up just I will pull up the hold on, let me just share the screen of the So this is the motion that we had approved last time from the four members who were president. And um, I meant to send it around to the people who weren't present, including uh, Stefan, Marcus, and Joe. But then it's some, it seemed kind of awkward to have people vote on it. So if you guys did feel comfortable endorsing it, then we could also just tell uh, TSO and the council that you've also approved it. Um, so, so again, this is based on the idea that um, that the sponsors were going to go back to the 2001 policy, and um, and so so what we passed was the following: you know, tax supports the idea of reducing light pollution in Amherst and using the latest available technology to do so. However, we have concerns about the traffic safety impacts if streetlights are removed, especially for pedestrians and other vulnerable road users. And if it's a sponsoring, counselors have said they're considering they decide to rework their proposal significantly and craft a new policy based on the 2001 policy. We encourage them to make the following changes um, to add crosswalks and bus stops as locations where streetlights will be provided. And then also 
there's a section in the 2001 policy that just talks about how we don't the town doesn't provide streetlights for pedestrians and residential neighborhoods and and we wanted to remove that so yeah i mean if the people who aren't if marcus or joe if you guys have any comments or if you want to also endorse that that's um you're welcome Go ahead. i mean eve sorry um, did you all talk about, I mean, in my opinion, we need more streetlights in a lot of places. Did you all talk about that at all? Like, I mean, I've talked about that section of East Pleasant um, repeatedly, but where, you know, if you're biking at night up East Pleasant, uh, shortly after Village Park, all of a sudden it gets really dark and you can't see. Um, and then also after, again, after um, the Eastman intersection, there's another section where you really can't see. And we, like, I think you need, we need more lights if we want people to be biking and walking at night and oh and also when we did that walk on north pleasant remember um we also found like it was just there are places that are really dark so i don't know so um, actually so one thing interesting with the tso discussion so the tso again the sponsors didn't show like their new policy but they talked about it and they said that they um and um, they both commented a little bit on the TAC motion. Um, so one thing was... Um, well, right now, they're not talking about location, right? They're just talking about... They, they aren't talking about location, but like if you look at the 2001 policy, it says like we will have streetlights at intersections and... Right, right. We yeah, will have so, streetlights, you know, at bus stops. Yeah. And so we had suggested adding the crosswalks, yeah, but also yeah. taking getting rid of some of that other language. You know, right. just that seems sort of unfriend. Unfri but right now, the only this legislation only looks at types of lights, right, and how to maintain them and that sort of thing. The location of that is in a follow up, which well, is yet to be determined as to when it's going to happen. The right? location, in terms of, I mean, the original proposal zones, was yeah. it it split it up into zones, right? right so that right. is gone. But at the same time, there is still the guidance, at least based on the 2001 policy, it says you will provide streetlights in the following locations, like at intersections or places where they, it's been deemed important. Right, that, but that's not a change. Issues. That's existing. No, those aren't changes, right? Mm -hmm. Gilford, did you have a comment with your hand? Y yes, one of the things they're concentrating on is actually the amount of light from the device. They want to actually lower the amount of light per device. Um, and cut down glare. Cutting out down glare is good, but lowering the output of light actually means more lights to light up a a, a, a sidewalk or a side you know, a, a bike path. So those are the things that are going to be kind of you're going to you're going to probably find it weird odds at um, UMass is U, UMass lighting is is what they don't want. They definitely do not want to see lighting like UMass has. So that's kind of what they're working for when they're in cutting the light down. So in the discussion about locations, like, right, so the TAC had supported the idea of having lighting at mid-block crosswalks, for example, right, that 77% um, of fatal traffic crashes happen outside of intersections, including at mid-block crosswalks. Um, and there were questions about, um, you know, whether there should be lights at crosswalks automatically or not, you know, or even bus stops, like maybe some people want to get off the bus in the dark and walk home in the dark. I mean, you know, so um, I can see us maybe changing some of the language in terms of like will be provided versus like, should, you know, consider providing them here. But one of the arguments is that it would be more, they thought, they thought at least it's more effective from a traffic safety standpoint to have, for example, like the RRFBs, the rapid rectangular flashing beacons at mid-block crosswalks instead of having light on all the time. Um, I can see that point in terms of, and I mean, I've thought about it more, you know, since I was listening to the discussions there, but that, I mean, there are some mid-block crosswalks that maybe do not have much traffic at night at all. Um, and so you wouldn't necessarily need to have lights at them all the time. Uh, but I definitely, I mean, it, 
it is good to think about having more of those flashing beacons if we have them. And I didn't know, Gilbert and I had asked you a follow-up question just about the relative costs and things, just because I know we can't have them all over town, for example, but it does seem like the town has been putting in more mid block, putting them in at more mid block crosswalks than we used to. Um, and and also just to get to your point, Eve, about I feel like the um, second part, the second um, point that we made in our response, um, there was something right. We won't put. So it was something restrictive about where to put lighting and we're suggesting to remove that so that there are less restrictions, you know, opening that up a little more, not saying that they have to be, you know, in neighborhoods, but that they could be in, you know, removing that exclusion, <laughs> which I think gets to your point. Um, that very well makes sense. And I appreciate that you're saying that they're not identifying locations, but I don't know. It, it seems to me that if, if there's a street lights policy for the town, it should include objectives other than, um, you I know, see. reduced light pollution. And that for to do what we were just talking with the ECAC rep about, which is really promote more people, you know, the mode shift of the 60% of maybe sometimes I'll bike or walk if I feel safe and comfortable you know, those people actually, most of them are going to need to feel like there's light all the way along a path. Like, I, I, like if you look at North Pleasant and you see all the accidents on that, I mean, yeah, that's a lot of drunk students walking up and down that street when a, in a not very well lit area. So that that's a real extreme case um, that I think definitely probably needs some more consistent lighting all the way up and down. But yeah, again, even like East Pleasant or um, Northeast Street, right, where someone was killed in the dark also, you know, if we want not only to support the people who feel comfortable getting off the bus in the dark, but the people who are nine years old and could get off the bus in the dark and cross safely and walk home, or, um, you know, or new people who just moved in from the suburbs to feel comfortable walking to and from campus up and down North Pleasant, then then it seems to me that one of the goals should actually be to provide lighting adequate for people that feel safe to use bike in pedestrian networks. But well, definitely, I mean, so- yeah, I think that definitely was part of it though, right? I mean, the feedback we got in our meeting was that they will be including, you know, a bike plan, plan and everything like that. So we can't say that they're not including it and all this sort of stuff because it's right now, you know, it's a half-baked solution, right? They're focusing on one side of it and you're talking about the other side and we can't push for the other side until the first side's finished because they want to take the time to actually go over everything that you're talking about. So there is no, oh no, we're not doing anything. It's, we need to talk about it more and they've, they've, um understood that and you know moving it off which isn't great right we should be doing it now but they realize <coughs> that they they can at least get to something but and i so, think marcus yeah. like even at this stage though so right instead of going back and just saying we're going to have the 2001 policy and then just add some of the details about types of lighting you know glare and light pollution and things like that for the individual fixtures. I mean, to me, if if TSO and then the council are gonna go ahead and adopt a new policy, recognizing, you know, as the sponsors have now recognized how super complicated it is in terms of if you do wanna create low lighting zones in town and high lighting zones in town, like that, those are huge issues and they would definitely wanna have a much more involved process for that, but even, to me, like even going forward with the 2001 plan with just these, I mean, they even suggested it could be like an appendix that could include like lighting standards or something. To me, I would like to see at least a little bit of update in, from the 2001 language to reflect the fact that like we do want, we do have a goal now of encouraging more pedestrian activity in residential neighborhoods. We do wanna be age friendly. We do want to encourage other modes and things like that. So 
Um, and I think that's why TAC and you, you know, you had missed that discussion, but I think that's why we passed the motion we did, that we still want to send a message, even before you delve into that whole second question, looking all over town, it's just, just have some kind of general principles and guidelines about where there's lighting and where there's not lighting. Um, and even just at the level that they're looking at it now, I mean, we did not get a formal referral back from TSO to look at it more, but at least you know two or three of the TSO members at their last meeting, they did say we really do think you should talk to TAC about. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not make recommendations with you that. about um, yeah. you know mid block crosswalks or things like that, and so. No, I understand that. Yeah. I mean, but we're dealing with you know politicians, right? They're after a quick win, and the quick win is do the little bit, and yeah, great. We already have a document that says. That we need to look to the more you know create um encouraging more different modes of transportation right in in the climate resiliency plan mm -hmm. it's already there so we don't necessarily need to go ahead and reiterate something just because we want to see it somewhere else right let's attack the little bit and do that but we really really need to deal with the location stuff and i think that if we kind of just try and um you know just put a little bit in there and just move off that's just going to be taken a success and we're going to lose the fact that we need to really get in there really dive into it because they i mean they are also dealing with people that don't want any lighting right i mean that's half the reason why this whole thing came about you know there are people out there in the world but you know, in Amherst, that want to see it in a more rural time, right? They don't want to see UMass lighting. They don't want to see too much lighting. So we've got to figure out how we can balance that out or how we can specifically address that. Uh, but doing it in the time frame they're trying to do it in isn't necessarily the best thing. So yeah, let's take a step back, rethink what we're doing. We do need to be part of that process. You know, we can't just be oh, let's get a little bit of an opinion on, you know, Thursday from TAC and we'll be good to go for the rest of the year. No, we need to be part of it. But we can't just expect just a little bit of, you know, a little bit of whitewashing of that issue and we're good to go for the next couple of years because that's what we would end up having if we had put in a, like a little statement here or there, you know. We really need to leave it wide open, show people the pain, and then we can get in there and fix it. And so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we do all generally support, you know, the idea of less light pollution and less glare and things. Um, I mean, one issue, I mean, this is outside of the scope in terms of transportation somewhat, but it, I mean, when I, and I haven't seen the new version of the proposed policy, but you know, some of their ideas about lighting, particularly when you limit the height of the lighting, um, that I mean, one big issue in Amherst is that we don't own most of the poles that the lighting, the streetlights are on, that, you know, eight, oh, close to 90% of them are owned by Eversource. And when Eversource builds taller poles, the streetlights get moved up because Amherst only has access to a certain amount of the pole and they tend to put the electricity at the top and then the streetlights are next to electricity. And so, I mean, from a traffic safety standpoint, having those higher lights does not do anybody any good. And they also, I mean, there's also, that's why people don't, and they, that's why some, that's why some people want to get rid of street lights is because they say, well, the, ever since they put in those new poles, the light is shining in my window and all these other things, they're not serving any safety function. I mean, I, that's like a much bigger issue than TAC and the council. And I mean, that's just how, how ever source, you know, makes those decisions. So I don't even know if there's anything we can even do in that end, or even if it's realistic of our counselors to have in their policy, you know, that we only want the lighting to be 20 feet or less when that's not going to be possible with the Eversource poles. No, Unless but I mean, we can, we can look into lens technology to redirect the... No, thing. sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what Guilford, I mean, Guilford's saying, like, check out the ones at Kendrick Park and tell them which ones we like and so So, definitely. So, I mean, right now the issue's in a holding pattern. So, I mean, we can see if TSO wants our input on more of it. 
So Joe, did you have comments? I was going to say Amherst Colleges did their uh, lighting tour, their walkthrough. And one of the questions that came up is how are they, they interact in these mid section areas, these crosswalks, especially down by like where they're doing all the construction on 116, um, where kids don't know where to walk, students don't know where to walk exactly. And it's really dark there, but how do you intersect with the town and who's gonna be making choices as to, I mean, that's like, that's the common phrase that came up. We don't wanna be UMass, but um, you know, how, how do you choose the, the technology, you know, the, the lighting and how are they gonna intersect with the town? You know, is the town gonna have the same priority or the, the common area, you know, is anybody going to want to put a light there or keep it dark, so. Right. I mean, maybe that could be a discussion, you know, where somebody from Amherst comes to, you know, one of the council, the TSO meeting or talks to TAC or something too. Be happy to. There's a really active grounds yeah. uh, representative for the president. Right. So he'd be yeah. involved. I mean, Amherst College is different, right? Because every, I, I, you know, I was, I, I've talked with a lot of people in town. They're all like, well, we could do that thing that Amherst College does, you know, the rapid beacons. And I was like, yeah, well, Amherst College pays for all that. So, you know, it's different because they can, you know, they're making really nice improvements or changes or safety, but they pay for it. And I mean, right, can, Guilford, you've they never- They can implement it, but- but our town can't do the, you know, we don't have as much money as Amherst College does. We don't have the resources Amherst College does. So in Guilford, those ones, I mean, you've talked about these you know. before, no. those um, like crossing beacons, the lower level, lower height ones that are on College Street and on 116, right? I mean, they don't meet any kind of standards, but also you, like the town has never installed any of those itself, right? Those are all from Amherst College. Right. right. Um, but the Amherst College wants to Amherst College wants to upgrade them all. So we're probably going to start upgrading them this summer. So what does upgrading mean? Yeah, uh, they're going to probably be RFBs at that point. Okay. Okay. And then those are meeting like, you know, M E U T C yeah i mean stuff, the, so. the little flashy bollard thing does meet it when you have the rest of the pieces in, but the other okay. pieces are gone. The in pavement lighting is was all taken. Well, that out. was not very. <laughs> that didn't last very long. So yeah, no, no. yeah. So UMass has that path that goes like over on the top of the hill between yeah. like Orchard Hill and Eastman. Do you all know the path that I'm talking about? Yes. No. Um, and it's got some nice lights. Um, I don't know. Are those like anything that would be possible? But there's sort of an in-between height, if I'm re remembering that, like, eight feet tall or something. Which is Eastman? It's the... the one where the cops are on. The what? Like, up near the dorms, like, the dorms at the top of the hill, like, on East Pleasant Street. Yeah. Like, the going up the that Eastman I'm talking Lane, about runs parallel to Lane. East Pleasant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right by the little pond there. Between the yeah, it goes the right by the um the disc golf course. Yeah. Oh, that yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> That's super nice. Yeah. It is super and nice. Well lit. It's, it's inviting. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's well yeah. lit without being overly bright. Like, is something That's like that possible? Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gilford. And actually, so <laughs> is something like that Gilford's possible? Gone. <laughs> You might not know because so they and they do have. There. I mean, that original streetlights proposal. It did have like streetscape zones i mean again they're backing off the location part but it did have streetscape zones that would have like lower level lighting as part of their plan so i mean i guess the the conversation to be continued so i can share updates when i get them from tso um i do have um Joe, I do have a question just about Amherst College lighting. I think I've asked you before, and it's not directly transportation related, but like those fields, the fields on Route 9, that sometimes those lights do end up staying on all night, even though there's no use there. Is it, I mean, does Amherst College put like, could or could they put timers on the lights to at least like turn them off if they're not? And use so the, the lighting issues before the safety committee. So that's something I could ask them okay. directly. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I know, like, when there's events there at night, I understand, you know, all the lights are on, of course, but then sometimes people all go home and the lights are still on, and I'm just because my neighborhood is up against it, like, people have commented that the neighbors who live closer have commented that they, it's very, very bright, and it's bright, yeah, so. I'll be curious to see if it's a matter that they just, I, you mentioned this before, did somebody just forget to switch it off or is there? Well, a right. And that's why I wondered if you could just have them like on a timer yeah. or something that We're you override the, the if there's an event the, there. On the lighting thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll make a big Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, it's, it's hilarious because it's like one thing to leave a light on in a room, but to leave a light on that lights up the whole neighborhood is really funny like that someone would forget to turn that off if of course now people, you live is. in a neighborhood i mean kim your neighborhood too with those new there's a lot of all the new housing oh like my god lighting. i have no yeah. idea what that's gonna what it's gonna happen there yeah that's gonna be yeah. crazy town so <clears throat> okay so before i would i mean i'd i'd really like to talk about this act to reduce traffic fatalities um it was on the agenda last time and and we didn't really have much time to talk about it. Uh, but I also recognize that it's getting late and just like Stella, you know, not everybody's had dinner and things. So maybe we can just talk briefly about just our schedule for the next couple months um, and, and other items. And then if we could circle back or we can also have a conversation at the next TAC meeting about it. I mean, one of my takeaways from that act to reduce traffic fatalities is just um, you know, it was passed in January. Most of it took effect in April. Um, you know, there are like Mass Bike and other organizations are doing outreach about the law to teach people about the law, including the safe passing distance. And then also Mass Bike is also doing campaigns to um, to distribute lights and to distribute, you know, flyers and, you know, bumper stickers and all kinds of things just to let people know about the law, too. So. I mean, there is some potential there if we wanted to get involved and do some of those things. That's one reason I've been bringing it up. But it seemed like a lot of good ideas. So we should. And I, I, I was just daydreaming. I saw someone the other day. You know, I, I ride my bike everywhere. I, I've given up driving a car for the most part. And I saw someone the other day who had like a a, a thing on their bike that was like sticking out and and I was thinking well but that's not exactly four feet why did why, why is it not and I what if what if what if we like did something like that which was like a demo I I I would I do it it would my kids <laughs> my kids would like be like they they would like close their eyes and not look at me but but you know, like four feet is a big distance and it, and it does feel safe when you're riding your bike. And what if we just like went up and down, you know, downtown Amherst with a thing that's like four feet and said, you know, this is what four feet is. And this is a new law something like that. Right. I do it. I, do it. <laughs> I like Much it. to the chagrin of my teenage children, but I would Make do it. Make them do it. <laughs> No, they oh, would not. Aren't they the ones? Wait, are, are they still driving to the high school? Yes. Don't even <laughs> get me started on that. Don't. It's, it's like the worst. Like, who I, are you? I think I think I might need to, you know, recall your committee membership for that. Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> I am like, yeah. I know. It's like, oh, sorry. Yeah. It's it's. Yeah. So. You, need, you need to have a. Uh, 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 a conflict of interest statement as soon as you uh, get on this meeting. Yeah. Well, so I mean, the big thing with the yeah the, the big thing with the four foot pass law is it says that you know cars can cross the yellow line and things. Yeah. Because one thing I've had some conversations with you know officials and and people are saying, well, wait, does that mean we can't have bike lanes anymore? Like, what if the road is too narrow? But what it's saying is that. If a vehicle, it's just like other types of slow moving vehicles, like a tractor or a carriage or anything like that. You just, you're supposed to leave them space. You're supposed you're to have awesome some safety. Uh, if you're also supposed to, to make sure it's clear. Sorry. Yeah, and make sure it's clear, of course, right? Whose purview so. is it to like go and check this four feet around the state? Like, is there somebody with a... 
police measure like who would receive the complaint if well, no. Were... So I think it's that it's that um, motorists have to leave have to... four feet when they pass yeah. the pedestrians. So it's not but... like you need to have a four foot like a bike lane. And no. it's not like you have to. It all has to be based on facility. If, again, if you don't have that built into your facility, then the motorist is only supposed to pass when it's safe to do so. Yeah. And when they uh, pass, they're sense. supposed to leave the four feet. So. And I always wave. I'm like, Hey, thanks for doing that. Like, like I wave to every single person that gives me four feet of space, like literally every day. I thought you were being friendly. <laughs> sure, that too. But I just, I just, it's, you know, positive reward. I, it works with my kids. It works with my students. I'm just trying to like make it work for motorists too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. And I wait a lot, you know, I wait behind bicyclists yeah. to pass and things, it's right? Amazing. Yeah, no, but so. I think more and more people are doing that, actually. I, I feel like that's happening. Well, yeah, um, let's help get the word out and help people no, see that. Yeah. So, so maybe I like my, that idea. My four foot like stick somehow might, might come to fruition. Or even, you know, we could even ask like, you know, the town if they want to promote it too or something. As the bumper yeah. stickers. You know. I mean, they do have, I mean, sir, I mean, there's a link in that webinar that I can send around the links that people, one, they can order, they can order lights, like for bikes, because the new law, it says that you're required by law to have a red light, a rear light, as well as a front light. Um, yeah. But it's a secondary enforcement. That means you can't pull somebody over just mm -hmm. for the lights mm -hmm. and that they're actually supposed to report back you know, in terms of like how many people are getting pulled over and where is yeah. it happening and what is the can, race? Can, we, can you pass like that, that around the UMass population, please? Like well, Kim and, and yeah. also yeah. Valley and also Valley bikes. Yeah, Kim, you could order a bunch of lights and give them out. I mean, I was hoping that maybe I will. There's something. Is, is UMass Eve doing anything for like bikes? Well, I think it's something we probably anything? need to talk about. We'll probably want yeah. Let's to talk, talk about, about it in another police. meeting. The, the, and UMass the police, police. Sure. the UMass police could be, uh, you know, a big part of that. Yep. Yeah. And the Amherst police, they do. Well, like, yeah, yeah, like right. But I mean, you're and, talking about UMass yeah. in particular. So, yeah. Sure. Okay. okay. But before we run out to seven, so let's just, so one of the things is that we typically meet on the first and the third um, Thursdays of the month. And that's also when all the TSO meetings are. So I don't know. If so we'll we, switch. not a big deal. Yeah. So I mean, I can't come on the eleventh. Is the only is one thing. Um, but maybe we could meet. We could just meet on the eight. I don't actually see a conflict with us meeting. Their TSO is meeting now at seven, right? So if we meet at five thirty, oh right, then we could just be done with our meeting and hopefully yeah. Guilford doesn't have to go to both meetings. Um, <laughs> Guilford does not look like he will do that. <laughs> Well, and the okay. town manager goes to the, the TSO meetings and he lets he lets staff know when they have to come to. Um, so I don't feel like we have much to talk about next week, right? So uh, do we want to try to, is it too late if we wait until the 18th or is that good? And 18th of May. I could 18th do that. of May? Okay, let's say the 18th of May. And then also, um, I know Marcus, and I guess I'm not sure if you were at that meeting or not, but we had talked to, I guess it was the last meeting. Um, we did talk about just trying to work hard on this bike ped plan and like going back through the meeting, original yeah. the meetings and just reconstructing those notes. And so we were creating an informal subcommittee to do that. And even I had, I mean, uh, Kim and I had volunteered to work on that. But if. Can I just, um, you know, well, I guess we'll see if the new school proposal passes, but I feel like um, when the new school proposal passes, I, I, I feel like it will, but, but, I hope so. um, but positive thoughts, I, wonder, Kim, positive I, wonder, thought. I wonder about like maybe having one meeting where we update based on, uh -huh. on that reality. Uh -huh. Well, we only have to wait until next once weekend, we right? finish what well, i yeah. think we have to wait till it till it passes right but right but the, the also... vote is next week so right. yeah, yeah. yeah and i but really do we have been trying to our map 
I think, I feel like we should, once we make, once the committee meets to update the mm -hmm. install, once we get our map pieces, done. Yeah. Uh, we should maybe that, I feel like that's a really important, um, like update, you know, oh, it for was sure. two years ago. I mean, and we could even, you know, year. talk to TSO and things about yeah. it. And I mean, one reason I had been trying to encourage Safe Routes to School and get in the town getting more involved again is because of like the different funding that's available, you know, for, as I, as I said, Springfield is getting, you know, the money and East Hampton's getting the money and you, but you have to have an active Safe Routes to School program in order to even qualify for it. And so there is a new Safe Routes to School coordinator for the four Western Mass counties. Um, her name is Tori and I've, I've emailed her and I haven't met with her yet, but I'm trying to set up that meeting soon. So hopefully before the 18th, we can have that meeting and start to move it forward. I mean, we met with the school administrators last spring and summer, and I think it's pretty easy to meet over the summer, but then when the school year kicks in again, then they go back into their mode of all the other things they have to do as school administrators and we yeah. lose some of that momentum. So that's where if we can pull in with ECAC and and also get like high school students involved and build some momentum. I think that would be great. So so everyone knows that if the school doesn't pass, you don't need to be worrying about any plans or anything for any projects because there won't be any more. What do you mean anymore? I don't pretty, understand. pretty much if the school if the school yeah. fails. All the capital sure. money in the town goes to maintaining buildings and oh. no more to yeah. no extra money to roads yes. and yes. any type of projects. Like no that. extra money for nothing. Yes. Well, would, I mean, is a town, if that happened, is a town going to try to pay for the school itself? They can't. No, I thought it. There, there's five, there's five buildings that are falling apart. Right. <clears throat> Including your building. Including your building. Right. Well, there, there's Wildwood, Fort River, those are the two schools. So they have to repair those schools because they don't have a new school because they didn't vote okay, for the new, okay. new school. Then there's DPW, there's Fire Station, fire and station. Library, library. Library, yeah. No, we're in deep shit. Well, there's no, yeah. no, there's no big no opposition. So hopefully that's. Well, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily. Sign. Oh, mean, I know. Yeah. That's there's true. no vocal no opposition. Right. Yeah, who knows? So, but I'll have an 18 year old who will vote for the school that day on election uh, day. I will have a new voter who will vote for the school. All right, I, 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 I have a voter okay too. Yeah, that new voter already voted. driving to the Eve, polls. Eve has a voter to. too. So. Yeah, right. You are right, Marcus. She will drive, but <laughs> so Tra Tracy and yeah. Kim and I all have 18 year olds. Are we all have people. high school seniors? Yeah. Ooh. Well, can, um, sorry, go ahead, Guilford. I was just going to say, is that stack in the ballot box? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the thing with a low turnout election, right, is it really is depends like on who shows up. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, I hope to I see mean, your three kids' names in the, uh, yeah. They will. <laughs> I, I Eve's, Eve's kid already voted. Oh, there we go. There we go. My kid literally turns 18 that day, so I don't think she can actually vote till that day. So same um, day so. voter registration. Yeah. That's um, pretty cool. That's a great birthday. So present. wait, Kim, you have a uh, something to yeah. No, I just wanted it's the unreasonably not anticipated. I just wanted to let you all know. Um, I was running, I, I run on Saturday mornings through um Groff Park, and this goes to you, um, Guilford. I there was a woman who literally lives on that corner, you know, right across from the entrance to Graff Park. She was um, walking her dogs. I think her name is Karen. I, they own their house, which is right there. And I, and I was like, I saw her cross and she almost kind of got run over or her dogs did by some super fast drivers going around that corner there. Um, you guys all know what I'm talking about right there at Graff Park, like literally mm -hmm. the entrance right there. And um, anyway, I was like, yeah, what do you think about this? And she she thought like the parking and 
the overflow was not an issue, which is, I know is something that we've all talked about, but I was like really interested. She's an older resident. I feel like she could be very critical because she knew the before and the after. And she really likes the sidewalks, which I do too. They're really awesome. Um, of course, the parking lot could be updated a bit, but but um, she was in, in, you know, we've talked with people before about, about um, converting that, you know, that road is paved and then not paved. You mean Mill Lane? Yes. Mm -hmm. And she, she was in very much, and I think all the residents are, agree that they don't want the rest of that paved because they feel like already that little, the little strips that are paved, people are going too fast. Um, and, uh, so, so see you Tate. Um, but, but I just wanted to give you guys feedback on that because I've been really curious about like what's been happening for people. Cause I feel like there are so many more people and cars there. Um, and, 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 she, and I was surprised because she really felt like, yeah, no, this is great. It works really well. And I just wanted to give feedback on that. Okay. I had a long conversation with this person. That's great. Except that people really do go too fast. Right. On mill, on mill. Line. I literally saw her almost her, she and her dogs, like almost get, you know, like very close, a super close fast car because people just try and use that as a connection somehow. But anyway, I just wanted to let you all know that. So my little update, um, which isn't really, it's not, you know, super time sensitive either, but I just, I just want to say, and I've been noticing and I'd send Kim a couple, <laughs> couple um, pieces of information on this, but just how, you know, when I look at the police blotter that there is like traffic safety enforcement, and I appreciate that, that there somebody was ticketed for driving the wrong way on North Pleasant Street next to Kendrick Park, which is awesome. And um, and that people are getting ticketed sometimes for blocking sidewalks and for not stopping in crosswalks. And April was April is still we have a few more days left. It is distracted driving awareness month. Right. So there's been some ticketing related to that and at least pulling people over. And so those are all great things. Um, I have been disappointed lately to see a number of people leaving the parking lot behind CVS on their cars and coming back out to North Pleasant Street, which I had never seen before. But I have seen that a lot lately. <gasps> and um so I hope That's the town can awful. do better signage or do some enforcement and just feel like you can't. I mean, I've that, never, that, I've never even conceived way? of doing that. Like, I've yeah, never no, seen I anyone. Either. I mean, is it is it something? That, is that the town's responsibility or is that the land? Guilford, is, is that, that private? private or? Yeah, well, it's three people's responsibility. Uh, it's CVS owns part, Barry Roberts owns parts, and the town owns parts of it. But that mm. little easement, like to go into the parking lot. Is that, yeah, is we, that owned we all, by all three. Uh, oh. It's owned. It's owned by one. And three of us and two others have rights to pass. Okay. So. There is no one way sign on any of that. No, there is. There's private. there's a one way sign on the building, but I think we need which to, building on which building on the CVS building or there's but a sign on that which, side facing facing the wrong way. Yeah, saying don't go back into the alley. Oh. There's a yeah, sign. There used but, to be a stop but, sign too, but everything we, we actually went back and looked and a lot of the signs oh. are missing. So they're all back. Oh, okay. Up. I suggest that we could have one of those tire things, you know, if you go the wrong way. <laughs> no. Oh yeah. Just, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Tire. But like seriously, that is like the most dangerous thing. So oh my God, that is dangerous. I would. Yeah. Have. And actually, the last time I saw somebody was trying to turn into the parking lot as somebody was exiting in the single lane. Yes. So. Wow. All right. Um, Taylor, I think okay. I, I think thank I you all. Our time is up, uh, but thank you all and good luck with everybody with uh, the end of the semester. And ciao. Good night. We'll see you. Thanks, all right. Take care. Thanks, Gilford. All right. Thank bye -bye. you, Gilford. Bye.